Robson. Thanks for being here. Hey, thank you, Liam. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask you about your playing style. You, your timing I find really interesting as a player, um, and it's one of the things that I think makes you stand out as a player. Are there certain people you listen to t for inspiration for that, or do you actually try and go outside of everything you hear from other players? Um, well, I, I just I'm basically uh, uh, a little Walter man, a Sonny Boy man. Um, when it comes to listening to blues harp players, and I don't listen really to anyone after those guys. Other, I listen to other forms of music, uh, especially jazz, jazz minouche, a bit of klezmer, um, and and really not not a bit, bit of rock and roll, but not too much. Um, I think Chuck probably just Chuck Berry. So I, I, I come at it from a sort of a jazzy, bluesy thing, and 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 yeah, I get I guess that timing has been really important for me because it, it was the one thing that stuck out when I was first listening to Walter and Sonny Boy um, yeah I, I just think it, it's it's the, the thing that really separates those guys out from the imitators sure and another thing which I've heard you talk about and which those players have in their playing is dynamic range and that isn't always the case when when you're teaching harmonica often it's something you really have to get people to be aware of because people aren't yeah. always aware of that it's that really it's really it's really um you know the more i've experimented with different types of music i've come back to the blues and i will never leave the blues again because i've you know i've got something that really sort of works with the blues you know and and, and gets to people but when i when i tried to do um a, a sort of a garage rock crossover because i was always really interested in trying to to take the harp you know into new directions and over new music and I found the problem with um, with garage rock was it was all it's all very driven and all very straight and and not very dynamic it's whole sort of raising depth is to be loud and raucous and primitive and I found that it just strangled the dynamics out of the harp and it made me it made me realize when I went back to do my blues project after and I was playing with a proper blues band proper like you know a proper level it suddenly made me realise, you know, how much I was missing when I, you know, wasn't playing dynamically. So on my new record for those who need the blues, when I was in the studio and when I was on stage with that band, they're a, a low band. You know, the drummer doesn't is not, you know, he's playing with dynamics. Everyone's playing with dynamics, and it got me back to listening to, especially little Walter, who plays with an ultimate sense of of of, of dynamics and restraint, which gives him places to go. You know, it, it, you can go louder, you can go softer. We can stay in the middle, but it gives them places to go and keeps the playing interesting. And also, I believe you're, you're not kind of a gearhead, you know, when it comes to, to all that stuff and, and technique-wise as well, that, that f perhaps it really deep down it's all just about the playing and the feeling. And, and obviously we don't have footage of Little Walter but the stories are that he'd play through whatever was there and he'd get a sound. Yeah, well, I think, that, I think that's right because I, I honestly think that the success story of Little Walter is the playing. I, don't, I mean, I think that he, in my imagination, because we haven't got much to go on at all, in my imagination, he had, he had these Dan Electro commando amps, the mics. He's putting it all together and I think he made the best of what he had. I mean, he was a genius about what he, you know, what he made out of what he had. But I think that... It's got so, you know, his secret is the precision of the playing. Um, you know, if you listen to, yes, the harp sound is amazing on You Better Watch Yourself or Rocker or any of these tracks, but it's, it's the tone he's getting through the harp, the precision, the weight, you know, the amp's playing a part of it, but it's, you know, what's actually making the amp sound great is the playing. So really, you know, for me, it's the playing first, and, and you can make anything, you know, I, you make, if, you, if your playing is good and it's solid and the tone's good, you can make any amp sound good, you know? Yeah. You get a lot of attention for the upper register playing you use. Is that something you're conscious of in your playing? Have you developed that on Well, purpose? yeah, I, did, I developed it because, as I said earlier, I really wanted to take, you know, develop my own style. And the upper register stuff just, um, you know, because no one had done it, it just started coming naturally. I listened to... Unkin Funk, the Muddy Waters album with Kerry Bell, and it's, that started something, and then several little Walters riffs that go beyond Hole Six um, started to play a part. But I think what it what it do, what I began to find was, and what the the, the critics were pointing out, well, it, it's this sort of sweet and sour thing. You've got all of those big, bluesy, brassy bent notes um, on holes one to six, and then from hole six up to ten. 
you've got a much more majory sweet thing. You still got, the, you know, you've still got the blow bends, but you can, you know, it just adds an extra element to the heart playing that that maybe makes it even more palatable and accessible to people, mm. and certainly more exciting. Because I think that when I've played live and you know you employ that against other harmonica players, it's a pretty good weapon. You know, it seems you've called them full circle in a way, trying to d use the harmonica in different genres that maybe it isn't used in that much, and then actually coming back to the blues and maybe doing the opposite which is trying to find something new to do with the instrument in uh, a genre that it's well, well established. Well I, th I think I think what I'm doing now is that I'm I've created my own style within 12 bar blues you know my own style of harmonica playing um, which is you know which is it's fine by me because you know it's so it's so amazingly communicative the 12 bar blues and you know it's all the blues templates basically the one chord boogies you know, slow blues, swing, all these different grooves. It's basically, it's a groove-based music. It's based on the groove, and then you add your, it's like hip-hop, you add your stuff on top, you know? I like what you said earlier in a workshop here at the London Harmonica uh, Summer Camp about blues being, to an outsider, very repetitive, and you, you sort of have to ha know the inside joke to, to get it, and the, the way that actually... It's like a sonnet, and, and there are infinite ways of displaying that simple form. Yeah, well, I think that, um, I think that it's, it's certainly become... There, there, two, two things, there, there are two things that have happened with the blues. Firstly, you have really boring retro blues bands who are playing classic styles in a very sort of uh, museum custodian sort of way that has sapped all the life out of it and made it very sterile. So people find that boring because they, they can't sense that seat of the pants passion of something mm. new. Or secondly, you have stuff that is billed as blues but is actually blues rock and doesn't have the attributes that actual blues has. So it's sort of, you know, you're caught between two, two sort of negative things. But if you can find your own way and, and really take seriously what those old blues guys were doing but do it in a new way that's your own style, then you've sort of got the world by the tail, you know. I think it's a... You know, for me, the blues is endlessly fascinating. It, it, it really is, and and and, but people don't come up and say that my, my gigs are boring, or, or that you know, or that my records are boring. And I think some of that's down to the upper register as well, because mm. it just adds a, a little bit of something extra that people aren't aren't used to, and it sounds a bit new and fresh. Well, you seem to be carving your own area of the blues, and as you say, developing your own unique sound which is great so long may it last fingers crossed yeah we're, we're, we're going to go into the studio again uh, towards the end of the year but we might do um, a bit more songwriting so we're a bit into blues songwriting like Willie Dixon mm -hmm. Muddy Waters where I mean if you listen to a lot of the Muddy Waters tracks like I Just Want to Make Love to You and Hoochie Coochie Man and I'm Ready you've got the verse chorus mm -hmm. verse chorus format and we want to you know see what we can do with blues rhythms and a blues feeling but with a verse chorus, yeah, sort of like tension released. Got any songs yet? Yeah, I do. But yeah. I'm not gonna. They're, they're all no. top secret. Secret. Okay. Well, the one, the one I've got, which is the title song, is a shuffle, but it's got it's verse chorus, and and of course, you know, the shuffle is actually pretty prevalent. A lot of classic mm. rock, you know, "Don't Stop" by Fleetwood Mac, a lot of the ZZ Top stuff. It's a great thing to work with and we're going to see what we can do with it. Sounds like you're not going to tell us the name of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's top secret, but I think it'll be the title track of the next album. Well, I look forward to hearing it, whatever it's called. Cheers, Liv. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank Cheers. you.